Hello, everyone. I'm Al Daldegan, creator and producer of the Leaders, Innovators, and Big Ideas podcast, supported by Rainforest Alberta. This podcast showcases the people who are working to improve Alberta's innovation ecosystem. The host for this episode is Tony Grimes. Tony is a contract programming instructor for SAIT and Inception U. He is the founder and organizer of the famous Pixels and Pints meetup group here in Calgary. Tony is a lover of space, pinball, and making things. Let's join Tony as he chats with Tate Hoyam about computer programming with accessibility as the focus. The mic is yours, Tony. Welcome to the next episode of the Libby Podcast. I'm Tony Grimes, uh, guest host for this episode. And our guest today is Tate Hoyam, CEO of Byte Tools. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Tony. So um, this is my first time hosting for this podcast. And normally what I do is I stalk my guests and thank you ahead of time for uh, making this easy for me. I just went to your website and, uh, oh, okay, he's got everything here. And one thing I noticed going through your GitHub is you have a wide variety of projects there. I saw like tons of, let's see, what did I see? Apache, we saw Node. There was something with Python, you did some Django, you kind of played around with Jekyll, you love Rust right now, you're into Linux. I guess basically, I kind of have an idea of how big of a nerd you are right now. How did this all start? Like what what got you into programming? What got you into just being a big nerd? Well, I've, I've always been into computers in one way or another. You know, I when I was, you know, 10 or 11, I was always on the computer, whenever there was a problem, my parents were like, oh, take and fix it, you know. But actual software development and in addition to that, you know, sort of Linux and that ecosystem, that specifically came out of Minecraft, out of out of all things that people uh, that bring people into programming. It was Minecraft. At the time, I was running a Mac and there was a bug in Java and it, Minecraft didn't work. And so... Some guy on a forum said, ha ha, try Linux. And I gave it a go. The bug wasn't there. So that started me on Linux. And being on Linux, having sort of full control of your system, that got me slowly into programming. It was that along with trying to make Minecraft mods, of course. (laughs) And how old were you when Minecraft was the big thing in your life? Probably 13, 14. Yeah, I'd say around there. So then, yeah, after that, it was, I I wanted to do that. I've still never made a Minecraft mod. I've moved away from that since, but it set me down a path. It set me down a path of being fascinated by how computers work and wanting to make things better about them. It's been a while since I've gone through high school. My first language was like basic in computer 20, whatever the name of the course was. Computer science like in high school nowadays, what was your uh, your experience with that? I don't really know because I was homeschooled. And so I did not have computer classes per se. I tried my best to do a more structured online learning. And at the time, the school I was with actually offered it in basic, believe it or not. And That wasn't my first introduction to programming. I had done a tiny bit of Java beforehand, but it was it was my first formal introduction to programming was that was in basic. And basic is a pretty old language go to's all of that. There's usually like something like a a passion project you might have run into fond memories of a first language. Basic probably wasn't it. (laughs) It was not the first project that made me realize that I could make a difference. It was a project that I got into while learning Mandarin Chinese. When I was learning that, what happened was I had all these documents that were in Chinese, you know, books and uh, short stories and such. And of course, I couldn't read them because I I couldn't read Chinese very well. But I knew some of the words and I'd try to get away with trying to read them, but it wasn't really working out. But for learners... For learners specifically, they have books with uh, the phonetic pronunciation of Chinese characters called pinyin or juyin, depending on where you're from. And I realized that 
I could probably find a way to insert that into an already existing document. So one of my first big projects was called EPUB with Pinion. And it would take an EPUB document, which is basically just a zip file with HTML in it. I extracted everything out of it and I was able to add these uh, phonetic notations on top of the characters so I could know what I was reading. That was the first, you know, passion project. The first thing I, you know, I, I worked 10 hours a day until I got it done kind of project. And that was sort of when I realized that I have the choice to change things for the better if I really want to. Yeah, and that seems like it joined two passion projects because learning Chinese just isn't one of those things you just do one day, right? No, no, it's not. Yeah, you're right. It, it was totally a, a cross section of passions, which is what, what I keep looking for today is something that's not just great engineering, but something that's great engineering, something that helps me out. Maybe it helps other people out, whatever it is. I'm, I'm looking for something that is that, that sweet spot of a cross section of interests. And now fast forward to today, just looking at your, I guess your Git history. Sorry for stalking you. Uh, that, that's all right. That's public for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> but you now have gone into Rust. And I have another friend of mine who you probably uh, know, Adam, who loves, loves, loves Rust. And I find it very interesting, this this language. How, how do you feel about it? What uh, Have you gotten to, into it? You like it? Obviously, you have some kind of interest in it. Uh, yeah. So Rust, Rust was, uh, I would say, more of an accident than a, than a choice. What happened was, at the time, I was talking to some friends from the UK and Romania, and they were getting together to uh, build a new piece of accessible technology. Uh, so for people who don't know, if you're blind and you're trying to use a computer, you need the computer to read stuff out to you. And that's called a screen reader. Uh, they wanted to make a better one. They wanted to make a faster one. They wanted to make a very type safe screen reader so that you did, wouldn't have uh, random crashes. And they chose Rust because it had that extremely strict type safety inherent within it. It also handles asynchronous programming really well. So they chose that. And then I came in as they were sort of designing this project. And I learned Rust as a consequence of this project more than uh, an intentional decision to learn Rust first. Yeah, it seems like that's a common pattern in your life. You kind of follow your interests and then whatever technology is in front of you, you just kind of look at it and you just, oh yeah, sure. I'll, I'll learn this. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. If, if it's Python, it's Python. If it's Rust, it's Rust. If it's shell scripting, it's shell scripting. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that I can get what I want to do done. I think, what was it, the first time that we first had a conversation? I think it was that uh, chess game, the uh, the pull request kind of thing. And I was very interested in that because, you know, as a teacher, I, I, I'd like to give back and be a good internet citizen and teach accessibility. And I got to be honest, I am not the best at it. I, I know the basics, but it's not like, you know, I'm great at going through the accessibility toolbar thing in Firefox or anything like that. And this really excited me about that, that chess game idea and like how you would even start with something like that. Tell us a little bit about that. All right, sure. So uh, this is for a website called leechess.org, L-I chess.org. And what happened was at the time I was wanting to play chess with some of my friends who were blind and they had their favorite site to do that. And I had my favorite site to do that. The problem was, is that the site I was using wasn't accessible whatsoever. If you were blind, you were out of luck. And their site looked terrible. And so I had a really time using their site. And so I, I saw this and I was like, man, this, this is a serious problem, you know, and, and it also segregates communities, right? You have, you have blind players of chess only playing other blind players of chess, which is just, that's terrible, you know? And so 
I found uh, a website which had a somewhat they were they were trying to have an accessible version of chess available, and that was Lee Chess. They're they're a, a nonprofit out of France, and I saw that and I said, okay, that that's that's something. You know, I can work with this. And so I asked some of my friends. I said, well, how would you want to navigate a chessboard? How would you want the chessboard to look like, feel like, semantically, how should it be marked up? Should it be a table? Should it just be a bunch of buttons? Like, what do I do? What do I do? So I asked for input. They told me what they wanted, and I took some inspiration from the site they were using originally. And I was able to put together a pull request for Lee Chess, extending extending their non-visual user interface to the blind, or rather, to beginner blind chess players. It was It was pretty good for people who really knew the game already and were very familiar with it. But someone who was learning was going to have a very tough time understanding what's happening. Like somebody who can't memorize the entire board with a a slightest glance. Yes, exactly. And it was mostly for those people. So I was able to put in a pull request. I, I had lots of them back me up. I said, hey, guys, if you really want this to go in, can you please make a GitHub account and go comment on the on the pull request and say, yes, I want this. <laughs> and it, it got approved. And so now if you go to leechess.org, there are two modes. There is the standard mode, the mode that I would use, and there is blind mode. And in blind mode, this completely separate interface shows up and it allows you to navigate the board with arrows and keys like uh, K or R, will bring you to the next king or rook in the board. So you're able to have sort of uh, peace navigation, go to the next pawn, go to the previous pawn in the board, that kind of thing. Getting a little bit deeper into how that will work, like when, when you asked them what they wanted, what did they answer with? Like, what is it like when they're... Well, you're blind. You obviously save money on a display. Now, do you just spend that extra cash on better speakers? Is it uh, some kind of weird Braille thing? Like, what does that look like to somebody? Yeah, so it, it depends, actually. Some people really strongly prefer speech. They, they will refuse to use Braille. I have a few friends that absolutely refuse to use a Braille interface because they hate it. And I have other friends that refuse to use speech and absolutely are committed to using Braille every day. So it's really more of a, a preference. It's, it's sort of like, you know, there's that one guy that has the, you know, 32 inch ultra wide curved monitor. And there's that other guy that's using that square monitor from his parents' basement 20 years ago, right? I, it, it, it's closer to that. You know, you, you have your preference of size, you have your preference of whether it's curved or not, and obviously your budget is a consideration in that as well. Having a Braille display, as they're called, are extremely expensive. Uh, they're upwards of $10,000 in a lot of cases. So a lot of people that can't afford it will be using speech. And speech is, from what I've seen, uh, more the default uh, amongst people who who can't see, they're they're using speech more than Braille because you can use that in a park, you can use that on your walk, you can use it on the train, you can use it anywhere. Whereas a Braille display, it's this big chunky thing you gotta haul around with you. So let's say we we had those two paths, speech and Braille. Uh, does that change the way that you structured things in your code, or do you not have to worry about that? Generally not. So. A Braille display, when connected to a computer, will generally follow the screen reader. So the screen reader is actually what provides the Braille interface. So instead of saying, submit form button, it will just write to the Braille display, submit form button. So it's really just a a medium of the same technology. Either way, they're using a screen reader to get around. Putting all of that in my brain... Trying to, you know, trying to visualize how that how that works. Yeah, it's it's all good. It's a lot of new stuff. I understand. Okay, so you've had this one. It seems so. I was go- looking through the pull, pull request and thumbs up all around. It seems in the in the comment thread. And was that your first pull request, or do you often make contributions to you know third party libraries? I try to make contributions, but frankly, there often isn't anything for me to add. 
a lot of times the issue is either much too complex, much too involved, or it's, a, you know, a library using C or something like that. It's not that I can't write in C, but changing something like that is a lot more difficult than writing some JavaScript, right? But that, yes, that was my first major public pull request on something which is used, you know, by millions of people. Uh, Lee Chess has millions of active users a month. So I, I, I was very proud of this one. I, ha I still have yet to do a pull request. It's, uh, you know, one of those things. I don't, I don't even know how to get started. It, and it's, it's tough, let me tell you. I mean, I, I saw the need for one of these pull requests. And it, man, it took me three weeks just to know what was going on in the code. When you come into a new code base and you have no support, you've got no help, you don't have a boss or colleague to go to, it's just go figure it out. I hope the documentation's good. <laughs> uh, most of it was written in TypeScript, but there was some Scala on the back end. I didn't have to touch too much of that. I only had to add a couple things on the back end, but mostly TypeScript. That's awesome. I just, I've never had the courage to jump into a code base that I don't even know about. Like, you know, where would you even start? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, exactly. And even, even if you decide to start, how do you not get discouraged after the first week of looking at the code and understanding nothing? And what about the second week where you still understand nothing? It took a lot of motivation from my friends who were sort of egging me on like, oh, you can't stop now. You already put a week into it, right? <laughs> it's good to have good friends like that. Wants to keep you honest. Uh, yeah, yeah. G good friends who want you to build their software for them. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, uh, for the, the viewers, we were just uh, setting this, uh, this podcast up for recording. And Actually, my first question was going to be Mac, Linux, or PC. Which one do you like? And then after looking at your GitHub, obviously Linux. And I just assumed because of my own bias that, you know, the, the software we use recommends Windows Mac. And I thought, ah, oh, he's probably got, you know, something that this will run on. I was like, okay, no, you're, you're definitely, you know, you started with that Mac way back in the day. And it seems like you've fallen down the Linux rabbit hole. So I was looking at that. What, what's your, you have that project, your latest one. And we talked about this before. What, what, what's an update to that, that to Odyssey that you've been on with? I can't remember what it was a BIOS. Oh, the BIOS. So I have, I have a few new projects that I'm working on. Yeah. So, so the BIOS is actually not my project. It's actually the project of EDK2. They're the developers of a lot of bio software for major companies like Asus and Acer and Dell. Yeah, so they are working on getting audio drivers working within a BIOS for Intel HD audio. That would enable blind users to use their BIOS, which is something basically that has not existed ever. The best you've been able to do is ask for someone to help you. Because BIOS comes first. There's not a lot that... I don't I, Like that's at the limit of my knowledge of of things is okay bios that's okay that's that's as far as i want to go <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah fair enough well the good news is, is that that's not my project the next major project i have coming up is actually a, a diagram tool so this is this is you know far into the future i'm sure but the the base idea of this is to separate the way we look at data and the data itself. A lot of times when you go into a university class, you're getting lots of diagrams that are images, which is fine for most people, right? But let's say you can't see the diagram. Okay, well, now the diagram is just image 123.jpg. Or what if you're dyslexic and can't read the font, right? All of those things it could potentially be issues. And it's issues for only a small number of people per problem, right? There's not a ton of blind people in computer science or a ton of dyslexic people in computer science. But collectively, altogether, it's, it, there's a significant portion there, right? So the idea I had is to, to, to separate the, the data itself from the representation of the data. This would enable a teacher to store all their diagrams in a sort of pure data format 
and then click export to JPEG or export to touch diagram for the blind. So there's a special printer that will sort of puff up certain areas of the paper to make it look like a diagram. Kind of like a Braille machine, but... Yes, except except it's instead of being Braille, it would be a high fidelity tactile graphic. It can be any size you want. You can change all that stuff. And instead of using colors, you can use patterns and have a legend for it and all these kind of things. It's a ton of work. So that that's why this project, I don't have an example of this project, right? This is more of an idea. But likewise, if you could hit image with dyslexic font in one click, now anyone can look at that same diagram, no problem. Colorblind, one click, done. And it'll have a legend saying, okay, yes, we're using this shade of gray for you. But just so you know, the class is going to be talking about green. I, I think this idea, the, the fundamental idea, because, you know, if you're a university or college teacher and you go to make a diagram, you probably open PowerPoint, right? You, you, you add some circles and you add some lines between the circles and there you go. Now you've got a diagram. But with a specialized tool for each diagram type, you are able to separate that that core information from the way it's being presented. And that could be a very big shift in accessibility for anyone. I mean, what what you know, if, if what if I want a plain text description of the diagram? Well, if the data is separate, code can be written to make it possible. So a more complex problem like the do people like the voice or the braille? That's just for the blind. You like now we have to figure out, okay, here's data. We don't know what it's going to look like before we get it. What would a like you have to distill it down so that anybody can make anything that they want with it, depending on what they're, I don't know, whatever they're bringing into it. Exactly. And that's that's something that's obviously extremely difficult and requires a lot of code per even type of diagram. Can you imagine the difference between, you know, a bar graph and just having like points on a plane? even like just map, that something map related yeah even just those two differences or or having like a map of the US or Canada and having the provinces be different colors what if it's not the provinces what if it's each riding of a uh, of federal districts or whatever you know all of those things require a, you know a special code process to go through which is just monstrous and scary but in theory once you do that work it should be mostly done for that diagram. And using the rule of 80-20, 20% of the diagrams are probably used around 80% of the time. So you can get pretty far with a pretty marginal set of... You don't have to worry about error bars until you get to academia. Uh, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So where are you at with the project? It, seems, it sounds like a really fun one. Is this a passion project? Hopefully a passion project. I, I don't know if I'll have passion for it in, in you know, five years when, I, when it's my full-time job. Well, we got we to gotta set a, a bar for our passions. Mine's three years. Yes, yeah, <laughs> of course. I, I want to somehow try to make money. If I can't make money off of it, I, I frankly can't do it. You know, we all have to live. So trying to figure out how to do that because I'm, I'm very pro-free software. I, I love the GNU general public license. I basically don't use any other license for code and how do you square that you know how can i how can i sell something that's free and anyone can download it's it's a it's a tough thing to look into and i i've i've considered all the options including making it proprietary but i i wouldn't be able to live with myself if i did that so yeah i think about it i think about it i don't know if there's enough people that care frankly about a project that, that you know Yes, it seems like a very fundamental problem to solve, but the truth is, is that it only improves the lives of what, maybe 2% of people, you know? Which is the whole, one of the reasons why you need to do it. But how do you do that? You know, like with rent and, you know, in the real world. How do you support yourself in doing that? Very interesting. So we got uh, summer coming up. Is this going to be for work or play? What do, you, what do you have planned? I don't know yet, actually. There is a decent chance that I could be moving this summer. If I'm moving, then it's going to be mostly that. <laughs> Not out of Calgary, 
I hope. Yeah, actually, out of Calgary, I'm. I'm <sighs> that breaks my heart, too. I know. <laughs> I'm. I'm trying to get out to Vancouver. There's. There's more opportunities there. There's more people to meet. There's more meetups to be at. Yeah, it's. You know, it's what you got to do. And and my girlfriend lives there, so that's okay. That's part of it Double too. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the plan is, I want to do lots of biking. I want to get a bike and just sort of peruse around the city. You know, I don't want to. I don't love trails. I. Personally, I actually can't see that well myself. So obviously, big mountain biking trails are not my thing. But, you know, perusing around the city, seeing what there is to eat. Love my food. So going to gonna try eating at all the local restaurants. And I'm just saying that just to make me feel. Better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then if I have time, I'm hoping to be able to also contribute to all these other projects I have going on and maybe make life better for, you know, those 10 people that, that really want it, you know? Well, it's going to be more than 10 people, I think. Somebody does have an interest in the types of projects that you run or just wants to hang out. How, what's the, the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah. So if it's a personal project that I have on my, my personal GitHub, I feel free to go to my website, tate.tech, T-A-I-T dot tech. Or if you're interested in some kind of business thing, you want to hire me, Tate at ByteTools.ca. Well, thank you, Tate, for sticking around for this uh, great podcast. For those of you listening, you probably already know how to get here, but uh, you can pick up the next episode of the Rainforest Libby podcast at rainforestalberta.podbean.com. And I bid you guys adieu. And uh, Tate, I wish you the best. And please, please, please stay in Calgary. But that's just my own personal bias. And uh, feel free to hit up Tate for a coach anytime you're in Vancouver. Have a good night. If you haven't already, visit rainforestab.ca and sign the Rainforest Social Contract. Become part of the inclusive, silo-busting, sector-agnostic, all-industry, open-sourced, ego-shrinking, ecosystem-building, entrepreneur-focused, wide-open, social barrier-smashing community known as Rainforest Alberta. This episode was brought to you by New Idea Machine. If you need software developers or you need software developed, New Idea Machine can make your ideas real. Visit newideamachine.com to learn more. Music for the show was created by Tony Deldegan. Please be sure to share this episode with everyone you know. Also, don't forget to come by and say hi at the next Rainforest event. Let us know what you think of this podcast. If you're interested in being either a host, sponsor, or a guest of the show, send me an email at rainforestpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Might I suggest that you also give a listen to Shift. Shift by Alberta Innovates is a podcast that showcases the incredible work being done by Alberta innovators. Join hosts John Hagen and Katie Dean as they interview the researchers, entrepreneurs, businesses, and service providers that are shifting our perspective in everything from health to clean energy. Visit shift.albertainnovates.ca or your favorite podcast provider for more.